Klang, kling, klang, klapp der Hammer mit sein Gesang. Kling, klang, kling, klang, zerreiß die Ketten und schlafen schwang. Und du akehrst und du seist und du fitterst und du nähst und du hammerst und du spinnst. Sag mein Volk, was du verdienst. Kling, klang, kling, klang. That song, what was that song? That That's a song by Chaim Zhitlovsky. Chaim Zhitlovsky was... Uh, probably the most important American figure on the Yiddish language campaigns that went on in the United States. Uh, actually, I would say he was considered the one person who was made Yiddish a language rather than, I mean, he, to analyze the language, the parts of speech and everything related to it. He was an old socialist from uh, Russia and uh, this was probably one of the few songs that he wrote. He was not a poet so much as a political writer and a campaigner. And every everywhere he went, he had great he had audiences. Uh, he was part of the revolution in Russia. Uh, in Nineteen five came to America, and uh, anyway, this song was called "Undu Akerst Undu Zest," and you plow and you sow. And it was based on a um, German song by Lessing, who had written it, a radical writer. It was not only based, but he mostly translated it from German into Yiddish. Now, that's people have a notion that, uh, that Yiddish is just a form of German, but it's really a different language. But he just gave, he gave it a Yiddish presentation, and then he added, he added the chorus which was uh, kling klang, kling klang, klapp der Hammer mit dein Gesang. In other words, it clings, clangs the hammer and molds the freedom of the people with the hammer, you see. And he just said, and he adds that chorus to it and it made a song of it. And it was probably a song that was sung probably by more Jewish workers than any, any other song during the period, maybe to the 30s and earlier. And, uh, and he himself, uh, can I tell a story about him? <laughs> but Chaim Zhidlovsky, how well he was known. When I, when I first came to Seattle back in the 40s, in the late, after the war, I moved to Seattle. I was, tr I, I was trying to rent a uh, uh, place for a public meeting. And the, the Workman Circle, which is, was the Arbiter Ring, which was the big Jewish organization, had pretty much folded up after the war and had a big building there, but uh, which they were, they, they would rent rooms there. So I went, I was trying to get a hold of them so I could rent a room, and they were not too eager to rent anything. So when I went over to visit them, I went with my friend Dan Roberts, and Dan was Chaim Zhidlovsky's son, who had changed his name. And when I went to rent the room, they were really reluctant to rent the, the, the place. And uh, so I uh, talked to the, the people from the Workman Circle there who were in charge of the building. And uh, I introduced them. I says, this, this is Dan Zhidlovsky. And the uh, person who was renting the place says, Dan Zhidlovsky, are you related to Chaim Zhidlovsky? And I, he says, yes, that's my father. Oh, he went into the back room, he called out his wife. He says, come here, here is Chaim Zhidlovsky's son. And I, I thought they were going to bow down. Anyway, we rented the place without any trouble. <laughs> but he was very, very well known in America. And... Uh, this song was also very popular. And of course, Yiddish was very popular. And that was, uh, it, it was, the Workman Circle practically uh, all had Yiddish schools, Yiddish classes, all of which ended at the end of the war because uh, the Workman Circle sort of almost caved in at the end of the war. 
I think probably the reason they caved in was because they accepted Zionism and uh, kind of let, let the Yiddish go. There were many, many reasons for it. Uh, but uh, I think, I would say a couple, a couple important reasons. First is that the Yiddish community was more integrated in American society. There wasn't so many Yiddish speakers, and the Arbiter Ring was pushing the Yiddish. Also, they were based pretty much upon the garment workers. And uh, in cities where there was not too large a garment worker industry, the, uh, or they disappeared. And Seattle, particularly, was never a highly Jewish working class area. In Los Angeles, it was. And uh, New York, Chicago, where Yiddish developed in almost all of the areas of a high working class character. And that was the language of the people, the lower of the, of the working class people. And uh, so uh, by the end of the war, things changed a bit. Uh, I mean, the, the Jewish community had changed largely because they had organized. They were among the, the great union organizers. And the garment workers for in New York was the lowest paid workers. They followed up with, <laughs> among the higher paid workers after they organized the union. And so the whole middle, Jewish middle class began to grow. But uh, Yiddish was uh, the national language. Everybody spoke Yiddish. And you had about three Jewish newspapers that were going out were very common at that time in history. And uh, uh, Chaim wrote for all three of them, whoever would accept his material. And it was the Forverts was around at that time. And there was the Freie Arbeit der Stimme, which the anarchists had put out. And uh, there was uh, uh, Freiheit, for Morning Freiheit, which was connected vaguely to the Communist Party. None of them directly controlled by any, but uh, uh, pretty much uh, both Yiddish, well, they, I suppose they were directly controlled. Maybe the Freiheit was pretty much controlled by the Communist Party. The uh, uh, Forwards was uh, pretty much social democratic. And uh, the Freiheit der Stimme, which was very artistic, a very a culturally very high magazine newspaper was pretty much anarchist, but to say that something is controlled by anarchists is, just, <laughs> is a little bit of an anomaly because they didn't intend to control anything at that time. You know, they they it was just the idea of the freedom of writing, which was characteristic of anarchism. I mean, you never saw an anarchist in a black mask in those days. And, and in fact, it would have been ridiculous for Emma Goldman to wear, to wear a black mask under any circumstances, you know. So they, uh, so the you know the Yiddish was so common, and then all of a sudden, the Yiddish theater disappeared. Everything in one fell swoop after the war, it all began to disappear, and that with the help of Israel, who declared Yiddish was not the language of the Jewish people anymore. And uh, with the creation of Israel, there was a real a blanket put on what was left of Yiddish. But Zhidlovsky was, uh, again, to get back, Zhidlovsky was one of the great uh, Yiddishists. Uh, and uh, the, the Yiddish theorists, not just, he wasn't so much, he wasn't like Peretz or Sholem Aleichem or the other Yiddish writers, but he was a political person. and. Uh, and he, he stuck to Yiddish, <laughs> which was interesting. But uh, I, there's too many things that you could say about him. I don't know. But uh, I, I've personally never met him. <laughs> well, we were going to talk about, huh? we were going to talk about this idea of uh, a Nakba uh, uh, of the, Yiddish. What, what, what did they talk about? No. We, what do I talk about? What, what we were going to talk about. Oh, I was going to talk about the knockbook because that is that is important. See, there's a little bit of a discussion that there's a having of the the Nakba. and I find that Zionism not only entered into Palestine and drove out the Palestinian people, but it was a very reactionary movement. And not only drove out the Palestinian, but it also decided that it wouldn't accept Yiddish as a language. And so there's another Nakma. It helped kill Yiddish. 
Now, at that, at that point in history, like I say, it's a kind of a nodal point right after the war, Yiddish during the 30s up through the 40s and even through the Holocaust was the language of the Jewish people throughout the world. 80%, 90% spoke Yiddish. And uh, they had, we had the great writers and thinkers and it was a very high level. You had a whole development of Yiddish poetry which started from just labor poetry then to the young get to more sophisticated poetry and beautiful poems were being written. They were improving constantly through the, through the first two decades of this century, uh, up through three, four decades. And uh, then the Yiddish press, uh, the uh, forwards that had uh, half, a, half a million, a quarter of a million subscribers in New, New York had a circulate, and, and even more read it out of five million people. So that, and so the writing was, and the Yiddish theater was, had become almost something, some, one of the great theaters in the world, but largely with the help of the Soviet Union, right after the war, the Yiddish theater was producing great works, one after another, Yiddish art, everything was growing. But the Zionists didn't look at it that way. They had, and oh, I, could, I should add to that, that during the Holocaust, uh, what's his name? Uh, geez, that's why I trouble with my, with my remembering names. He put out uh, a collection of some 250 songs that he collected that were written in Yiddish during the Holocaust, you see. And so, so you, you still had this whole uh, development of the culture went all the way through, through through the Holocaust. But as far as the Zionists were concerned, this was all trash. They didn't want any of it. They didn't. They weren't interested in Yiddish because it was the language of a backward people. As far as they were concerned, the only thing that would make Jewish a real people was to have their own state and their own army and their own nation. And uh, that read read ran contrary to all of Yiddish tradition and Yiddish writing. They, people wanted a homeland, but they didn't want a state. And uh, the Zion, I think the Zionists only grew on the basis of anti-Semitism. They were nearly all, the leaders of them were German Jews. And as German Jews, they had felt very much the aristocracy of being German, which was really the top European cultural group for during the uh, last part of the 19th century or part of the 20th century. But they were feeling very strong, the anti-Semitism against them. And, uh, and they, they disliked the Jews from the ghettos who were the Yiddish speakers who were coming in there. And they thought they considered Yiddish just bad German. And so they, uh, the first thing that they did was they cut off Yiddish was not, the national language would be Hebrew, and Yiddish was considered an alien language. So at this point where Yiddish was in a crisis, they deepened the crisis and made it impossible to develop. I, I think in a way they were actually afraid that if, uh, if, if they recognized Yiddish, and there were so many artists and writers coming to, to Israel, if they recognized Yiddish, that there would be a real cultural explosion that would overtake them. I, mean, I can polemicize a lot on this if you want, but actually the, the Zionists contributed absolutely nothing to Yiddish culture and history produced no writers, no great thinkers, nothing. Except there are a few religious ones like Boomer, who, who was a, a Zionist, but, but he was not one for a state. He wasn't a political Zionist. He thought we could have our own communes and the rest. And he was a brilliant thinker. But outside of that, I cannot think of any particular Zionist that contributed anything to the Enlightenment or thought, or even to the development of Jewish culture. And uh, the, the, the only thing that they had was a theory that if we have a, a Jewish state, we'll end anti-Semitism. And that theory is pretty much going to hell right now, you know. <laughs> There's a whole new development of anti-Semitism that's developing around anti-Israel or anti-Zionist. Uh, anti and 
and, and there's no real end to it in that way. But the Yiddishes with the Bund, boy, I'm going around in circles, you know. That's fine. <laughs> the Yiddishes with the Bund had their own theory that there was an international Jew. Their idea is not nationalistic. And the basis of that was the Yiddish language and the Yiddish culture. And so it was, called, it, was always, it, was a, it was a nationalism in its way, but a nationalism without a state. It was an expression of reality. And with the continuation of Yiddish, we would maintain a people on a world scale with a culture, our own, you see. And that's what they demanded, cultural autonomy, the right to develop your own culture. And uh, that, to, the Zionists didn't have a culture except the Hebrew religion way back. And most of them were atheists. So it was kind of hard to stand on that basis. But uh, the religion gave them the basis for saying Palestine is ours. You see, they went back to that. They had a 2,000 year lease on the country, you know, that they could just walk in and take over. But anyway, uh, they were experts on the uh, whatever works, works, you know. They're good organizers, good organizers. How much am I going to go on on this? <laughs> well, let me ask you to go a little bit more deeply, okay. if you would, into the Zionism of someone like Martin Buber. About what? The Zionism of Martin Buber. Oh, Martin Buber? Why, what distinguished him? Because I think that for many Zionists today, people who self-identify as Zionists, yeah. They look to Martin Buber for a humanist form of Zionism uh -huh. I guess, as the yeah. basis for their own Zionism. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, Buber's role in, in uh, offering this kind of humanist, non-statist form of Zionism. Well, like, I can't speak too much about Buber, except for, from, his, from his political role, if you want. Uh, uh, I, I know that Buber was had a tendency to, to, Buber believed very much that there should be a homeland for the Jews, but he believed also in the communal existence of the Jews, that we could live in a society of e equalitarian society. He was sort of an anarchist in his own way. And uh, for him, the basis of that was in the Jewish religion. And he was a very religious person. And, but he also uh, was convinced, and I'm only, I can't say what, I go into his, his mind, but from what he was written, that, that people could understand religion better than the church could, than the synagogue could teach it to them, which is uh, sort of the idea that, uh, <laughs> Well, my, my wife once expressed that the church is a way of getting people to, 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 to get the people not to get a religious experience, to keep them from getting a religious experience. And to him, uh, Israel could represent that feeling, that a new society which could be a, a light unto the nation, to all the nations. And every time there was an attack upon the Palestinians, he would write against it. He would say what we had to do, what we have to do here, and then he would lose. But he wouldn't quit. Well, I'll stay with what we've got. And he'd try again, and he'd try again, and he'd try again. And that was also part of his theory. He says, if I'm going to be in this fight, I got to stay in it no matter if I keep losing. And he did keep losing. And, uh, and one fight after another, as Israel drove out the Palestinians, as the Zionists drove out the Palestinians, he stayed. A lot of his supporters left him, a lot of his political supporters, because he still tried to be part of the Zionist government, because he considered himself a Zionist, but not the same as the political Zionists. And I think uh, eventually he would convince, but it wouldn't do any good. You know, Ben-Gurion, who was probably the most opposed to him, is, <laughs> but he wasn't really, he couldn't say he was opposed to him. He was, a, he was a friend of his, but at the same time, he didn't, he was, we have to do what we have to do, was Ben-Gurion's attitude. But after the 67 war, he finally seems to have come around to Ben-Gurion's position, and he decided that, all right, we've got this much, 
We've won it. Let's keep it and go and go from here, you see. But uh, that ended his career. He was through after that, you see. Uh, and what I guess Ben Gurion that uh, Luther didn't understand and many others is that it doesn't matter what your long range view is sometimes, that the facts on the ground push you, you see. People who are, who are looking for power get power, they want more. There's no end to boundaries of countries. We are defending ourselves from one place to another. And so Israel was always defending itself. It has defended itself all the way across Palestine, and in pretty soon will be sending itself the force at the banks of the Jordan, you see. So that's what we're getting in the situation. And I think all qualities of idealism are gone in Israel. I cannot see anything there left. I'm, I'm afraid I have to say that now. At first, because I, when I was young, I, I, had, I was in the socialist movement, and a lot of our young socialists got with the Polo Zionists and with the young, and they wanted to go over to Israel to build, you know, uh, the kibbutz. And they, went, and they were trying to build colonies. They had that in mind. They weren't going over there to drive the Palestinians out. If, well, they, they figured that, well, they, would, they, they bought the land. Of course, you know, you really didn't have a legal right to buy the land. It's like buying land from the Indians and moving in, you know. But, but they all went there with certain ideals. And it may have been that Martin Luther would have uh, I mean that that, that, that <laughs> Boomer would have would have uh, won out if there was a slow acquisition of land. If they could have built up land, acquired friendship with the people around it, that moved in a few more people and the rest. But the war, the Holocaust, and of course Britain and the ca capitalist world pushed them for to do as rapidly as possible to take over the area. You see. And so the, uh, they encouraged they encouraged these Zionists. Mostly they encouraged the Zionists because they, they wanted to get rid of all of the, all of the capitalist world. Shall I get class conscious here? <laughs> all, all of the capitalist world wanted to get rid of, of the radical Jews. The, 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 uh, the, the Yiddish-speaking Jews were, were all socialists, all of them. I mean, I talked about three magazines, but all three were, were various categories of socialist ideas, you see. And, uh, they, uh, and in the labor movement, the, first, the explosion in New York of the garment workers moved all of the, changed all of the American unions. It was the first agreements that were made that formed kind of a, a uh, pattern for other union organizations. And, I know that Rose Pesota, who was a friend of ours as an anarchist, was called in when they organized the steel workers. She was one of the organizers of the garment workers. And they, they were people that were constantly involved in the organization of workers, which didn't make the capitalist class very happy. And they were also were very active in the different movements. I, I, I think probably as far as the communist movement was concerned and the rest, you would probably say that maybe 10, 20 percent were Jews. And uh, this doesn't make any, anybody too happy on the top. And this was true in all countries. When Hitler moved, the first people they attacked were the Jews in, in, uh, in Germany. They, uh, the first people they went to the, the first concentration camps were, were, were Jewish communists, Jewish socialists. Went to the camp. First, they started socialists and the Jews, and so Europe, all of Europe, all of the Allied powers and the rest were very eager to get the Jews out of their hands. And what a better thing but than to create a ghetto down there in Palestine? And so they decided first. Balfour had a fight for it in England. Look, we can take some of our own people that we don't want, these are all Europeans, we can put them down in that area and we can solve our problem by getting rid of them here and we can solve our problem in the Mideast by sending the Jews in there. So 
the conclusion, boy, I'm going in such a circle, you know, the conclusion you would have to draw from this, it wasn't the brilliance of the Zionists that brought him in there. It was the desire of the various powerful industrial countries, the capitalist countries. They sent them there, and they, and they said Palestine would still become a part of, the, uh, of, of, of uh, Britain. The other countries were given independence, but not Palestine. Sent the army in there, protected the Jews, actually, uh, though not, not overtly. They were supposed to be neutral in the thing. But then at the end of World War II, the Allies sit down there and says, what are we going to do about the situation in the uh, Mideast there? Well, they got a situation. We'll, give half a, we'll take half of uh, Palestine and give it to the Jews, which will be our client state down there. We'll do what we can, you see. And that's about the, so it was, so the Palestinians, the, uh, the Zionists who, whose basic theory was we could end anti-Semitism if we rely on the powers that be to help us. And they were right. That's how they got it. They didn't end, end anti-Semitism, but they got their state by relying, by using the desires of the powers that be to help them get a state. And... Uh, that's not, a, that's not entirely new, you know. <laughs> you know the Purim story. Purim's on here. You know about Purim? You tell, celebrate Purim? Tell the Purim story. Ah, well, what's the Purim story? You got, you got a misogynist you got a king, you know, who's really an anti-Semite, because all of his advisors are anti-Semites, you know. And he's out, he, <laughs> and they're out to kill all the Jews. And how do they stop it? Mordecai sends his his niece in, <laughs> his daughter in to send to uh, his, I guess she's his niece, yeah, his niece in Esther, to to live with to to be a wife of the king. See, he himself spies for the king, and between the two of them, they get rid of Haman and they stop anti-Semitism by cooperating with this rotten king. You see, I mean, there's a certain lesson in that story. It's not the same as the Hanukkah lesson, which is a, a mass rebellion, but it's a lesson of how you can solve a problem by working with the powers that be of working into them, you see. And so, I mean, I always think that that's the, the lesson of Purim, and probably why Purim is one of the stories of the Bible and the Hanukkah is not. <laughs> anyway, but uh, how did I get over here? <laughs> <laughs> but I was going back on that, yeah. But anyway, uh, the whole the whole point that I try to make is that that uh, the idea of getting rid of Yiddish, which came was was really a way of getting rid of the thinking of the working class of the Jewish working class. It helped. It was a real good a real good assistance because any anybody who would study. Yiddish writings, literature, would recognize that all of them were were anti-state people. They were all ideal. They were they, they had an ideal con idealist concept of the world. Uh, and no, nobody uh, who who was a Yiddish writer or thinker could have in those years supported what was going on in Israel today. So they knew what they were doing when they got rid of Yiddish. But now they have to get it back. <laughs> That's the new subject. <laughs> what, were, what were some of the concrete steps that were taken uh, to stop Yiddish from being used in, in Israel after independence? Jeff, after Hal the, Jeff, after Jeff Halper talks about how it was banned and so plays, plays would have to be scheduled in such a way that the posted uh, time for the performance would always be a couple hours after the actual performance so that everyone knew uh -huh. that whatever was posted to show up two hours early and then by the time the authorities came around the play had already been performed. <laughs> what other kinds of... Oh no, they, they, the question of, of what you had to pay, you were... Uh, the other thing, they, they were treated as an alien, an alien language so that they had to make, make special payments to get a theater and to put on a show. They also had to deal with uh, some of the rabid uh, anti-Yiddishists, the Hebrists, and who 
would often, often attack people who were in the theater. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't go into, I can't go into how, how many types of ways they had, but the whole idea was that they discouraged any speaking of Yiddish. I was at a, at a school, at a Yiddish school, where we had a teacher that was from Israel, and she taught, uh, she was, and, and we, we, this was all composed of older Jewish people who came from different backgrounds. And we had this group, and there was a big argument that went on between us over whether such and such a, a, an expression was really Yiddish or whether it was in a different way, blah, blah, blah. because when you came from different communities, the language changed a little bit. And she knew all the dialects, especially, and, and she would correct us. So I was surprised to discover that she was from Palestine, from Israel. She's Israeli Jew. And uh, so I asked her, I said, how come you speak such an excellent Yiddish? And uh, you, uh, uh, you're, and, and I know that they don't, they don't approve of that too much in Palestine. <laughs> so, well, she says, I'll tell you, my mother, when she, in the early 40s, came to a talk with which Ben Gurion was speaking. And she got up in the audience to ask him a question. And she asked the question in Yiddish. In Yiddish. And he had a translator next to him who translated it from Yiddish into Hebrew for Ben Gurion. And Ben Gurion answered the question in Hebrew to the translator, and the translator answered it back to her in Yiddish. So she says, my mother was furious. She says, what is this nonsense? You speak as good a Yiddish as I do. Why do we have to go through a translator? Well, he says, Yiddish is not our language. He says, and from that day on, my mother, oivtsalochas, which means to spite them, always spoke Yiddish, <laughs> always spoke Yiddish. And uh, so, so it's, it's not a question so much of, of, of just the uh, amount of, of uh, suppression that goes on, but a whole social suppression that goes on. You see, that you can't even speak about it at a public meeting, you don't speak Yiddish, you see. And, and I, it was a way in which it wasn't just theater, it was in a way in which a whole people were, were suppressed. I mean, they were bringing all these people from the Holocaust who didn't, they didn't speak Hebrew. And now they're a great new democratic country with the people that don't speak the language. You know, it's a, it's, it's, it was a very repressive thing. It had gone on for, it wasn't something new really, because the, there had been the fight between the Hebraists and the Yiddish that had been going on for half a century. The, uh, but what was happening, that everybody who was a good Hebraist wound up speaking Yiddish, writing in Yiddish. All the Yiddish writers were trained as Hebrew writers, nearly up parents, Shalom Aleichem, the rest. All of them had, had studied Hebrew, started, but they started writing in Yiddish because it was the language of the people, you see. And this is, uh, when you have a state, when you have something autocratic and you want to push down, a language is a lot of good help. You know, the, 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 the uh, Catholic Church could use uh, Latin for a long time against the people. Then, but then as English developed, the languages developed, they had a little bit of a struggle, but they had, then they had to accept the new translations, you know. So, uh, language is, is not such a small part of life. It was, it, I, could, I, I would say that from the, oh, from the, about the year 1000 on, the thing that united the Jewish people as much as the origin, the religious origin, was the language. And, and uh, so, if, and Israel was always that way. The, the, the marriage was put in charge of the, of the synagogue, and which is Hebrew. You see, the, the local rabbis, that was their responsibility. Even though the state was supposed to be secular, there are certain areas were left for this for the for the church, for the church. <laughs> well, it's a thing for the rabbis. Uh, so it's it. The repression was there all the time, 
and it was in throughout the whole society. But earlier periods, they actually uh, the, er, the first parts of in Palestine when the Yiddish players came came into Israel to play even before the the, uh, the separation, there would be attacks upon them from the uh, right wing uh, the right wing Jews. It was just you know real physical attacks. They beat them up. They wouldn't let them play. They wouldn't let them perform. But after after the uh, uh, revel, well, you call it the revel. After the the takeover by the Palestinians, I don't think that the uh, the attacks were. You're quite right. That the attacks were quite that overt. You know, I mean, like you said. They, the, the show would go on late. Tickets wouldn't show up, which was another thing. Advertisement pots were just pulled up, pulled down, so the ads were t tear, torn down for plays. But now the, that's changed a bit now, uh, because among other things that they have discovered somehow that without Yiddish they haven't got any coal, they haven't got any. They haven't got any history. They haven't got any culture. They had erased a thousand years of Jewish history by, by erasing the language. It's what I called in one letter that I wrote a silent, a uh, fireless book burning. You know, while Russia killed off all the uh, fine Yiddish writers, Israel was more gentle. They just killed the language. And so they, nobody would have to read them anymore if they could help it. But now suddenly it turns out that so one person re described <laughs> described Israel as a land of Hebrew-speaking Gentiles. You know, in other words, they had no separate culture anymore. So now they are reviving Yiddish a bit there. I, again, you get Yiddish comics from Israel. You know, I've got singers to sing Yiddish songs from Israel, you know, and uh, try, let, now that it doesn't seem to be a threat to them anymore, they are trying to revive a little bit the Yiddish language. And uh, so there has been a revival, and uh, I would say one of the big revivals in the United States is uh, with Aaron Lansky's International Yiddish Book Center, which is uh, presumably non-political, and I guess he's, I guess Ansky is trying very hard to keep it non-political, but which actually is growing and growing and growing in the number of pe people who are interested in Yiddish, but this is on an upper level, not on the lower levels of Yiddish. So it's going to be hard, but uh, I, I think that uh, while the Yiddish language may be gone, the Yiddish literature is there, Yiddish theater, Yiddish sculptures, all there, great plays great stories and beautiful, beautiful poems. And I, I have recorded about 150 songs. <clears throat> and uh, one book of, uh, what's her name? The uh, Voices of the Jewish People, Ruth, Ruth, uh, Ruth, oh, Gordon, Ruth, my head. And anyway, uh, it must be a thousand songs that she has written down in one book. There you've got thousands of Yiddish songs, and all of them tell the history of the Jewish people. They're all part of life, you see. Now, Israel may someday develop that, but they can't, they're not, <laughs> it's gonna take, it'll take a hell of a lot longer than it took for the, for the Jews to do it. And, uh, oh, Jesus. Ruth Rubens, pardon me, Ruth Rubens. So, and she was, in fact, I learned, I learned more Jewish history from Ruth Rubin's Voices of a People than I, than I could learn from any book, just by tracing the development of Yiddish songs through history. It's good. In fact, I gave, I think I told you, I gave, I gave a lecture on Jewish history through Yiddish, through Yiddish music. And so we sang our way through history, and I think that's one thing that will remain. He, even if the language disappears, the song still remains, still stay. Uh, I don't know how, when, when they talk about bringing Russians into Israel, how they determine that they're Jewish. I could determine them. <laughs> I could determine because I don't think that anybody kept a mezuzah for for 500 for 50 years, you know, uh, from the time of the revolution, where they, they had a, a menorah hiding somewhere in the corner, which is nice and romantic. It may have happened, but uh, 
I'll tell you one way, if, they, if you sang a Yiddish song and they recognized it, you'd know they were Jewish. I was, Sidney and I, Sidney was my ex-pianist, were invited to sing for, for a group of some 60 Russian immigrants in the United States on a program, you know. And these were all older people. And uh, this is about, oh, I guess about 15 years ago. They were coming to, the, many had come to the United States. And we came there and I sang a group of Yiddish songs they'd invited me to sing there. And when I got through, it was just a room of about 50 people, you know, with a nice little room. They all stood up and clapped like mad. I don't think they were yelling because my voice was so bad or so good, but they were all just thrilled and some of them were crying. These are songs that I heard when I was a baby, when I was a child. It was part of their life. And so I think Yiddish music is to me also very important. And they're, they're bringing a little bit back of that, it, it, uh, getting a few more Yiddish songs. Unfortunately, <laughs> they, you get this, they have the Holocaust Memorial in Seattle every year, which is very interesting. But they take the songs that were written during the Holocaust by people that were expressions of their deep feeling, and they make operatic tunes out of them, you know, with a whole orchestral background, you know. It's like taking jazz with a full symphony orchestra, you know. Something is lost, you know, and uh, the feeling of it. Uh, oh, now, let's see, what circle have I got? You got a whole circle. You make a circle around, there should be a point in the middle of that whole thing. But, well, I wonder if, um, if, would you be willing to sing a song a cappella, maybe one of your favorite songs? Oh, uh, well, one of my favorite writers, uh, I, I, uh, the songs that I could sing a cappella <clears throat> are songs that uh, that are not so much worker songs uh, as songs, but uh, I can sing one of a different vein because not only not only were the the Yiddish writers were all rooted somehow in uh, Jewish background in, in, in Hebraic studies. See, but when you say you can make them religious, that doesn't work too well because fundamental, Jewish fundamentalism really only exists for fools. See, I mean, the Yiddish student that went to school, really Yiddish, Jewish student, I mean Jewish fundamentalism and Hebraic fundam is, is, is a misnomer. They had to study not only the Torah, they had to study the commentaries and the commentaries of the commentaries and the commentaries of the commentaries so that it, it was a whole range of thought and all kinds, you know. And so the, the Yiddish writers were really trained in all of the argumentations that went about the Torah, the Bible. And Itzik Manger, who was one of the, Itzik Manger was one of the, one of the greatest of the Yiddish poets and writers, wrote several poems that were a, a bit, slightly satirical of his own background, but never nasty, you see. And this is one, how long a song do you want? As long as you like. Well, I'll give you this is a ballad that I sing there. But Monger had written this, and uh, it's very interesting because I'll give you the English and then I'll give you the Yiddish. I'll give you, tell you the story. Uh, oy vey. Hmm. I want to sing you a little song about a golden peacock that flew over the Black Sea to bring a love note, a beautiful love note to Rabbi Tom. That Rabbi Tom is uh, one of the great uh, historical uh, Hasidic Yiddish figures. Uh, who wrote the letter? Verhot the Sukhif Kishwiban. It was written by the Queen of Turkey. She wrote it in red ink and sealed it with a hot tear from her eye. No, what did the letter say? It says, Rabbi Tom, Tom, I love you. Why are you silent? I can't eat, I can't sleep. I'm dying with desire. Now what does Rabbi Tom do? Rabbi Tom twists his pious, 
his beard aside, and his beard slicks it down, and three times he says, Fe. And, and the, the little goat that lives at the place, the little white kid, helps him out and says, Meh, meh, meh. And, but what about the rabbits of the, of the wife? Oh, she gets quite angry, you know. She hits him with a rolling pin. And he says, hey, you've got Gentile girls on your mind. You've got shikses on your mind. And what about me, your hard-working wife? What about me, huh? Now, who could have written such a story about the famous and illustrious Rabbi Tom? Well, it was written by the tailor's son in honor of Rabbi Tom. But on Shabbos, on Saturday, between Friday and Saturday night, the town joker got a hold of it and rewrote it in perfect rhyme. So, lo mir singen a schöne Lied, hei diddle diddle dum, wie die goldene Pave flieht, über schwarzen Jam, und trug da liebes Lied. Well, shall I start again? However you like. Okay. Oh my God. Lied de Okay. Lo mir singen a schöne Lied, hei diddle diddle dum, wie die goldene Pave flieht, ihr bellen schwarzen Jam, und trug da liebes Brivele, a schöne liebes Brivele, vor dem Rabbeinu tam, vor dem Rabbeinu tam, ai, 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 Bidi-bip-bai-bom! Wo steht geschrieben im Brivele, hei diddle diddle da Geschrieben, ah, Rebbeinu Tam, ich liebe dich, wo sie schweibst du nu? Ich esse nicht, ich trinke nicht, ich werd zu setz von Bänke nicht, ich habe nicht kein Ruh. Ich habe nicht kein Ruh, ai, 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 Und das Ziegele in Stahl, und das weiße Ziegele, helft ihm mit der Mäh, Mäh, helft ihm mit der Mäh, 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 Ei, 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 Nu und sie der Rebetzen, hei diddle diddle doi, sie klappte mit auf Wolgerholz und sagte immer so, Schicksis leg in dir im Sinn, nu und jak und jak wo bin, dein heißgeliebte Freu, dein heißgeliebte Freu, ai, 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 Bidi bip bai bom. Freft, was hat das Lied gemacht? Hei diddle diddle dum. Der Schneider Sohn hat es vertracht, le kove dem Rabbeinu tam. Und Schabes zwischen Tag und Nacht hat alle Zarein gelacht. Akkurat in Drom, akkurat in Drom, ai, 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 ai. Ay, 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 bidi bi 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 No, that's a little song. But there's a couple of things that are interesting, which somebody other would notice, is that most of the Yiddishes were not only Hebrew and Yiddish, and they also hold Russian, they knew the language, but they were several languages, you see. And, and the song has in it several different dialects, which, you know, when you translate, you don't get them all in there, you see. Like the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Queen of Turkey speaks Deutschmerch, you know, she says, uh, 
Rebbe Tom ich liebe dich, wo je schweig. So, I mean, this, these are very Germanic phrases that she uses. You see, wo je schweig to do. Ich esse nicht, ich trinke nicht. Anyhow, so uh, then uh, his wife speaks with a Galiziana accent, you see, and he has all the accents going in. And when I sang this once for a group at, with Sydney was playing, and a friend of hers who was a, uh, a Hasid, uh, got, got very angry. He says, you shouldn't sing a song like that about Rabbi Tom. I says, I didn't make up the song, you know. But actually the song, the last verse has a kind of a way to, to get out of the whole thing, you know. It was, this was done by the Tom Joker we were trying to give, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So anyway, he was quite angry. But I told him, I said, I didn't write it. <laughs> but, but Monger's poems are beautiful, and uh, there were a lot of them. And there were so many writers. Like I say, they're going to have to revive them if they want to have any kind of a culture. I got a letter from the Hillel. You know Hillel? That's the adult group that runs the Jews, Jewish students, you know. That's what it, the letter comes from the whiskey man. You know the whiskey man, Bronfman. Well, Bronfman, you know, Bronfman is whiskey, you know, he's, he's, uh, really. And he's, he, is, uh, he is in charge of controlling the Jewish youth, you know. That, in fact, Hillel has got all kinds of financial help and not, enough, not much student help. And it's not, it's not really a student organization as far as I can see because the letters come always from the adults telling how can we control the youth. And so... Among the things that the, the last letter said that, that out of ten Jewish youths, eight don't recognize their, are, are reluctant to recognize their Jewish background. And what's the solution to the problem? Why don't they recognize it? For obvious reasons. They, they feel embarrassed about Israel's situation. They have been convinced, you know, that they should all be Zionists, that they, they may be willing to be Zionists, but they're not willing to support Israel. And he's, of course, a hundred percent supporter of Israel. So what, what he what he proposes is we have to indoctrinate them, you know, which isn't going to do my damn bit of good. And uh, at the same time, I got a letter last week, a, a book from Christians for Israel, a great whole book with a did you get that? A whole book with a record in it, which which pretty much says that well, if you don't want if you're pro-Israel, you don't have to be Jewish. You can also be a Christian, you know. So. I, I, so there's this whole tendency towards assimilation, which brings us back to uh, Chaim Shedlovsky's prediction, which was at the end when he really said pretty much that uh, if the Yiddish language goes, the Jews of the diaspora will disappear, be completely assimilated. That was his prediction, you see. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's beginning to show a little bit has a, but happily, the Yiddish language may be disappearing, but the culture remains. The writings, are, everything is being translated. And I think we have Ansky, yeah, uh, from uh, the International Yiddish Book Center have been translating one work after another. The books are reproduced. In spite of the fact that everybody thought, everybody thought he, Lansky, everybody thought he was ridiculous to start this collecting old Yiddish books, he has now almost got about two million books that he's put in the library. That he has, he has students. He has overrun with students that come in there for six months or, or uh, to study Yiddish and then to handle the library. They become students and the rest, and so his. Uh, uh, as a rebirth with him. It may be with an intellectual center, but at least the culture's not going to die. It put out too much, and it's too, really, really too much. I mean, I can show you my list of libraries here. This is part of it. That's only part of the li I mean, the, 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 it is only part of my library, but, the, but uh, poems and songs and the, again, Volumes and volumes of it. The uh, Workman Circle now had a revival after, and now is teaching Yiddish again in their classes. And uh, the Mlotics have put out four big volumes of Yiddish music and with songs and scores. 
And, uh, and also on every score there is a historical commentary on everything. And so everything is going on. And oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I think really that, what, what can I say? Oh, my, uh, I, the, the National Yiddish Book Center gives me more, more confidence in the history of Yiddish. And uh, the movement, I'm afraid, against Israel should be more Jewish. That's the other part of the question. <laughs> I, would, I would like to see sides going up and saying, APEC builds anti-Semitism. <laughs> you know, in some way in which we make it clear what everybody knows, actually, every, every, even the Jewish movement knows that APAC doesn't run the position for the Jewish people. They don't. They don't agree with it. Nobody. Most of the Jews still vote Democrat. They don't oppose. Most of them are opposed to the war. Opposed to the policy. Uh, but that's the, that's a big press secret. Nobody's supposed to tell you that. You know, uh, like that. I'm away from the subject, but like that minister said, the, he goes to these colleges and, and they have all these Arab speakers. Remember he mentioned that? They say we're repressing opinions. Well, it's all right if it's an Arab speaker speaking about the Mideast, because you can't tell a university that they should get a Mideastern professor who is from the Mideast. But the attack is upon Jews who are writing about the Middle East. Them they don't want, you see. If you've had experience writing to the papers, if you write as a Jew attacking Israel policy, they're very likely will not print it. Very likely will not print it. But if you're an Arab writing against it, well, that's figures. You're prejudiced, you know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, any other? Any? Hey, I've, I've been talking, and you haven't been asking me any questions. I didn't need to. Uh, we've been talking for an hour, though. I should say you've been talking for an hour. <laughs> I think it's a terrific program. Um, and I'm really glad that you sang, because uh, I think it uh, came through very nicely. Um, so I wonder if uh, we could wrap up now, if there's any, if you want any concluding remarks. One thing, uh, one kind of a wrap up. If I would wrap up this thing, uh, I don't know. The one thing that I I, I haven't mentioned. Well, which is really at the center of the whole business, but I, talking around in a circle, is that that Yiddish develops with the enthusiasm and the hopes that ended the 19th century, and which were realized in a great sense in the Russian Revolution, that that of the working people growing and taking control, and the. Uh, the first years, ten years of the Russian Revolution saw the, the great blossoming of Yiddish. Yiddish theater has never been as high and as great as it was in the first ten years after the Russian Revolution. And the Yiddish language just blossomed then. And then came the repression and the press down against them, the killing of the Because wherever there is a rise in people's thinking and feelings, Yiddish has been part of it for the Jewish people. When there is a rebellion against autocracy, and it's kind of my hope that maybe as this current rebellion <laughs> continues on, that Yiddish again will become part of the rebellion, that it won't be separated. Uh, I, I think that Lansky and the Yiddish Book Center is here, and the Jewish Jews in the anti-war movement are over here, and he's trying to ignore that, and they don't want to pay any attention to him. I think the, the movement really doesn't understand Yiddish at all, doesn't want it. And somehow, if it becomes really strong, it'll get together somehow. But yeah, Yiddish always has had that quality of being part of the struggle. And in Israel, it's still the same. It's still the same. They have to keep, keep the Yiddish out because the Yiddish will come in with all kind of cultures and they cannot justify Israel policy with the Yiddish language. So I have, I have great hope still that somewhere in this great struggle, Yiddish will sneak its way in. But, but my big hope really is that somewhere in this great struggle, oppression will end. And that, of course, is a Yiddish concept. We've been, all of Yiddish stories, all of Yiddish poetry is based on the idea that this too will end, this expression. We'll get through with this part. Maybe it, we'll get a new oppression, but we have to get through with this. It's one after another. But the idea of the struggle for humanity 
is inherent in Yiddish culture and Yiddish literature. And uh, that's probably by the great reason that they don't, that nobody wants it around if they can help it. You know, that's my general feeling on that. And so I, I, if I would, I would end my little thing with the last part of that cassette, which is uh, we put together this, the various different songs of rebellion and uh, the international is, uh, is part of it. And that's, whew. I'm getting tired, I talk too much. Gleichheit Arganeiden, was schaffen wird der Arbeitsmann. Das wird sein schon der Letzte und ein schiedener Streit. Mit dem International steht euch für Arbeitsland. 